Hello and welcome back to Quantum Mechanics. Today we're going to start um, a long discussion on angular momentum. Uh, angular momentum plays an incredibly important role uh, in quantum mechanics, uh, almost a surprisingly important role. It's also a lot more complicated than you might expect. Now in the loosest sense of the term, angular momentum is about um, systems that do this. So for example, you might have uh, an electron orbiting uh, nucleus. In the context of the Bohr model, you would have a point orbiting the nucleus. In the context of, for example, Schrodinger theory, you would have some delocalized cloud of electron probability density, but it would still be swirling around the nucleus. Uh, and again, loosely speaking, uh, when you have swirling of any form, then you have uh, angular momentum. Uh, question, how do you study angular momentum for within a quantum setting, which is the topic of chapter six? And we'll start our discussions on this topic uh, today. We'll go through sections 29 through 33. Uh, we won't finish all of section 33. We'll study orbital angular momentum, angular momentum associated with swirling or orbiting uh, objects in space. We'll then introduce the spherical harmonics, which will be a complete orthogonal set on the unit sphere, which is immensely useful for reasons that will become clear in studying quantum mechanical angular momentum. We'll then have a very, very loose, heuristic, and fairly poor model uh, for picturing uh, angular momentum, known as the vector model. Uh, it's poor because uh, these things can't be pictured classically, and this model is some heuristic attempt to visualize in classical terms uh, an intrinsically quantum mechanical object. We'll then consider a general theory of angular momentum, uh, a general representation-free um, theory of angular momentum, representation-free in the sense that we've described uh, in several previous classes. Why do we do this? One, because it's our first example of representation-free quantum mechanics. Uh, secondly, if you want to consider spin, um, the phenomenon of spin is you have a particle such as an electron, you bring it to rest, it's a point particle, there's no swirling in space happening, you bring this point particle to rest and it still has angular momentum. Uh, this is called intrinsic angular momentum, uh, and we give that the name spin. Uh, studying spin, um, uh, spin is, can't be studied using the same methods as orbital angular momentum. Here we develop a completely general theory of angular momentum, which can be applied to both orbital angular momentum, spin angular momentum, and any other sort of angular momentum in a quantum setting. So let's begin with orbital angular momentum, studying from a quantum perspective, uh, angular momentum associated with rotation in space. So classically, I might have some particle at some position vector r relative to an origin O, and that particle might have some momentum P. And classically, the orbital angular momentum, which we give the symbol L, uh, as you know from more elementary courses, that orbital angular momentum L, that, angular, that momentum associated with swirling, is R cross P. So we could choose to write um, both P and R in terms of Cartesian coordinates. P has Cartesian coordinates, P, X, Y, Z. This is again in a purely classical setting. Uh, R has Cartesian coordinates. X, Y, Z, again in a purely classical setting, you know how to do cross products and so you could write down uh, the Cartesian coordinates, L, X, Y and Z. The X, Y and Z components of this formula and what you would get would be uh, Y, P, Z, minus Z, P, Y. This is a way of helping me to remember this, X, Y and Z uh, in a circle. And this idea of cyclic permutation, I've written down my first formula, x, y, z, and the y and the z get, then get flicked around in the second half. This is just a mnemonic for remembering this formula. If we now replace x with y, y with z, and z with x, we'll get the next formula, y, uh, z, x, and then we flip around. And now if we replace y with z, z with x, x with y, y will become z, z will become x, x will become y, x will become y, and so on. So these are our um, uh, Cartesian components of, of our orbital angular momentum, purely in a classical setting. But this is, of course, in quantum mechanics. We want to take this expression, this classical expression, for orbital angular momentum and make it quantum mechanical. So we remember equation 31. 
the Schrodinger correspondence rule. For momentum, we replace momentum with uh, this object here, which is proportional to the gradient operator. So if we do this, um, we apply this to the classical theory, then R cross P is going to become R cross. Now the P is minus I H cross grad. The minus I H cross can come out the front uh, and we have our grad. This is now our orbital angular momentum operator in quantum mechanics, equation 199. Again, we could choose to write this thing out uh, component-wise if we wanted to. Y PZ, and PZ is going to be minus IH cross D by DZ. Uh, PX will be minus IH cross D by DX and so on. And so with uh, the Cartesian components of this Schrodinger correspondence rule, we get equations 2I1. Minus IH bar comes out the front. And we get Y D by DZ and so on. Let me just write d by dz as this shorthand. This means d by dz. Again, uh, yep, and z d by dx. Sorry, x d by dy, etc. So these are our um, uh, Cartesian components of orbital angular momentum operator. Now, as an exercise, we're going to show, or you're going to show, as exercise 54, that there's a certain algebra associated with these uh, orbital angular momentum operators. Uh, these operators, by the way, are Hermitian, uh, and I'll leave it to you to prove that Alex, Ly, and Lz are Hermitian. But there's a certain algebra associated with these operators. So this is the commutator of Alex and Ly, uh, and what you get, as you're showing the exercise, is IH cross times LZ. Then we do our cyclic permutation. We replace X with Y, Y with Z, Z with X, and then we do it again. Y becomes Z, Z becomes X, and so on. Now this um, algebra has a name. It was studied by the Norwegian mathematician Sophus Lee. Um, and so this is called, uh, in his honour, uh, a Lie algebra. So al 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 algebra in the sense of abstract algebra. So this is a so-called Lie algebra. How much quantum mechanics can you do knowing nothing more than this Lie algebra, together with the fact that the Ls are Hermitian? Uh, we're actually going to develop our whole general theory of angular momentum using those facts alone. And remember that we learned in exercise 46 that our commutation relations are unchanged under unitary transformation. And so if you work in terms of this Lie algebra alone, uh, this Lie algebra of uh, the complex permission operators Alex, Ly, and Lz, then you're working in a representation free way. We'll do that with the general theory of angular momentum. For now, I want to take a step back and just say, well, we know that there's a connection between non-vanishing commutators, such as these non-vanishing commutators, we know that there's a connection between non-vanishing commutators and an associated uncertainty principle. We learned in, ex in equation 72, which I'll rewrite now, that if you have two linear operators A and B, you can form this uncertainty product, the uncertainty in the first operator times the uncertainty in the second. We learned in exercise 72 that there's an uncertainty principle Here's the commutator of those two operators. Suppose this doesn't vanish. Here's the expectation value of the commutator. Here's the magnitude of the expectation value of the commutator uh, multiplied by a half. We learned in exercise 72 that the following is true. Hence, if two operators don't commute, there's an associated uncertainty principle. Conversely, if the two operators do commute, if their commutator is not, then there is no associated uncertainty principle. The different Cartesian components of angular momentum don't commute. Hence, there is an associated uncertainty principle. Hence, you can't think of uh, L as a vector. Because if you think of L as a vector classically, you know, this vector is the angular momentum classically. Uh, that idea intrinsically suggests or implicitly suggests that 
the x and the y and the z components of that angular momentum vector, that classical orbital angular momentum vector, are well defined, but uh, there's an uncertainty principle, so you can't simultaneously define um, Lx, Ly, and Lz, or more precisely their expectation values, with arbitrary precision. So this, this, is, this is certainly contrary to the classical doctrine, and is where things begin to become interesting. So let's introduce Let's think Pythagoras' theorem. Let's introduce the squared angular momentum operator in a, in a natural way. Yep. We now have this squared angular momentum operator. And when you do exercise 55, you'll learn that this squared angular momentum operator uh, that it commutes, in other words, has a zero commutator with, it commutes with Lx, and it commutes with Ly and it commutes with Lz. Hence, if you were to pick L squared and any one Cartesian component of angular momentum, this right-hand side would be naught. You know, delta L squared, delta Lz, for example, would be naught, because this thing's naught. So you can precisely and simultaneously define both L squared and any one Cartesian component. Of, of L, and that's typically chosen just arbitrarily to be Z. Now, we're talking about stuff that does this, right? And stuff that does this, again, I'm being loose and hand wavy, stuff that does this is more naturally described in polar coordinates than it is, um, than it is in, in, in Cartesians, right? You know, this is more naturally described in, in polars than in Cartesians. So, question, how do we change uh, these? fairly simple looking equations from Cartesian form to polar form. Now you know about change of coordinate systems, you've done second year level uh, vector analysis, uh, you're, all, you're all wizards at this kind of stuff. Uh, you know what the spherical polar coordinate system is, so I won't draw the diagram. Uh, the point is that we're changing from Cartesian coordinates to spherical polars. Um, if you don't know already, uh, what the physicists call theta and phi, the mathematicians call phi and theta, which is immensely confusing. Um, so what the physicists call theta and phi, that the mathematicians or many mathematicians will call the opposite. That's not satisfactory and it's, um, uh, uh, there's no consensus there. So this is the azimuthal angle for the purposes of this class. Uh, and this is the polar angle. If you don't recall those terms, um, please just revise spherical polar coordinates, because what we're about to do will uh, exercise your uh, knowledge of uh, coordinate transformations from Cartesians to polars um, in a maximal way. In fact, when I was being taught this stuff, my lecturer told me, I told the class, that we'll do this calculation once in your life, um, which, is, which is now. So you'll do this calculation um, once in your life in exercise 56. So here's how we get from, from um, uh, in this case, polars to Cartesian coordinates. These transformations, by the way, can be read directly off uh, figure, um, um, figure 18. So the question is, what do these things look like in spherical polar coordinates? And the answer is they look um, uh, disgusting. Uh, equation 206 write down the, the spherical polar coordinate form of Lx, Ly, Lz, and L squared. And again, um, these equations are so complicated, or well, many of them are so complicated, I'm not going to write any of them down. The right-hand side of Lx is going to be some mess, but note that it depends only on theta and phi. Uh, similarly for Ly, some other mess, which depends only on theta and phi. Lz. Interestingly, it's simple, so I'll write that one down. Minus IH cross D by D phi. So you differentiate with respect to the pole to the azimuthal angle uh, to get LZ. Uh, L squared, again, is some uh, complicated mess that depends only on theta and phi. Uh, deriving those expressions explicitly uh, is what you do in exercise 56. At this point, you do this and you get um, 
you're happy because you get to exercise all of your mathematical muscle in deriving these um, horribly complicated expressions that I've caricatured here. But you might also be asking yourself, is there a better way? If you do representation-free quantum mechanics, then you don't have functions of position because position doesn't exist. You're working with Lie algebras, right? You're doing nothing but algebra. No calculus, just algebra. So um, when you do this calculation, feel proud of yourselves, but also ask yourself, is there a better way? If you can do it using representation-free quantum mechanics, then you have no need to muck around with calculus. You have a world of pure algebra, which is kind of cool. And again, a, a little bit uh, ancient Greek from one perspective. Anyway, we're still in the midst of functions here. We're not yet in the theory of general angular momentum. Uh, we need to, uh, to deal with the calculus. You do exercise 56 and enjoy yourselves. Now, since uh, L squared and any one Cartesian component of L commute, let's pick on this one, the fact that L squared commutes with LZ. In other words, the commutator is naught. Hence, uh, you can precisely define both L squared, which is um, both L squared and LZ. Hence, think about this, you can have what are called simultaneous eigenfunctions, objects, functions that are uh, simultaneously an eigenfunction of both L squared and LZ. So the idea of, um, of functions which are simultaneously eigenfunctions of both L squared uh, and LZ um, follows directly from the um, zero, the vanishing commutator in the, square in the square box. Now L squared and LZ, as I've emphasized earlier, depend only on the polar angles theta and phi, hence the eigenfunctions um, depend only on theta and phi. Now these y's are given a name, they're called spherical harmonics. Uh, these things are called spherical harmonics, which is uh, the title of this section, section 30. In the older literature, uh, these things are also called uh, tesseral harmonics. I also warn you that there are many different definitions of these objects, uh, all of which are proportional to each other or, or uh, related by linear transformations. Again, no consistency in the literature. We want these things to be simultaneous eigenfunctions of L squared and LZ. And I've just uh, taken the space I needed to write down my equations. So, so let's do it again. L squared will act on the spherical harmonic. And these um, integers, L, uh, these numbers L and M, are going to label the spherical harmonic, and I'll talk about that soon. These things are going to be an eigenfunction of L squared. L squared will act on this to give some eigenvalue times Y back again. So there's some eigenvalue I need to put there, and I'll do that in a moment. But it's also going to be an eigenvalue of LZ. Some eigenvalue uh, times the spherical harmonic back again. Now let me give the eigenvalues a name. I want to call this eigenvalue M, and that's going to be called the magnetic quantum number. Now, purely for convenience, I can call this eigenvalue whatever I want. I can call it M, I can call it P, I can call it Q, I can call it M times H cross. Um, this just involves a rescaling uh, of the said eigenvalue. There's no loss of generality in putting a H cross here, uh, and this is put in for convenience. Similarly, I can call this eigenvalue whatever I want. It turns out to be convenient to call it L into L plus 1 times H cross squared. Now, this is just a number, um, and, and since that's a, an, a, a, currently an arbitrary eigenvalue, um, arbitrary eigenvalue uh, corresponds to an arbitrary L here. Yep. So we're just writing our eigenvalues. Uh, in a particularly, in a way that will be convenient in retrospect. Uh, this L in the present setting is called the orbital angular momentum quantum number. The orbital angular momentum uh, quantum number. All right. Now I'm going to state a couple of things without proof. And I'm going to state it without proof because I'm going to prove it later in general. Uh, statement number one, uh, the magnetic quantum number M can take a series of values, 
minus L, minus L plus 1, and you keep adding 1 until you end up with, with um, uh, L. So I state without proof that M is an integer uh, and that L is a positive integer. I've given them their respective names and that M can take on this set of values. All of those things will be proved in due course, in fact, in the general theory of angular momentum. I also want to make the point that the set of all spherical harmonics is a complete set in the sense of bricks out of which you can build a brick wall. If you have an arbitrary, well-behaved function on the unit sphere, it'll be coordinatized by theta and phi, azimuth and polar angles on a sphere. This is a, a well-behaved function. It's got to be differentiable. Uh, it's got to be uh, continuous. It's got to be single-valued. That's an arbitrary function. These are going to be our building blocks, our spherical harmonics. Uh, we can stick coefficients out the front. Those coefficients I'll call S, and they'll depend on the L's and the M's. And then you'll sum over all allowed values of L and M uh, to, to synthesize this arbitrary, well-behaved function on the unit sphere. Uh, this spherical harmonic expansion is, is immensely useful in many settings, from nuclear physics in a quantum setting through to working out uh, seismic vibrations on the surface of the, of, of the sun, um, whenever you need to describe uh, functions uh, which naturally live, live on a sphere, such as vibrations on a drop of water or, or a sun, uh, or vibrations on, a, on the surface of an approximately spherical nucleus, then spherical harmonic expansions will do it for you. Explicit expressions for spherical harmonics are given in equations 211. I won't write those down now. Let's move on to section 31, this heuristic model, this so-called uh, vector model for angular momentum. And I've already begun to disparage it, and I'm going to disparage it some more. So vector model. So what we're trying to do here, the vector model for uh, angular momentum, we're trying to picture, in a fairly loose sense, uh, the, the equations that we've written down and um, studied regarding angular momentum. In particular, we know that you can think of orbital angular momentum. Uh, we have an L squared, which in some sense, you know, if this is a purely classical setting, L squared will be the squared length of the angular momentum vector. LZ would be the Z projection of the orbital angular momentum vector. If we were doing classical mechanics, this would be the angular momentum vector, which has a well-defined length. It would have a well-defined projection onto the Z axis. It would also have a well-defined projection onto the X and Y axes, and so this would just be the vector for the angular momentum at some instant of time, and it's got well-defined X, Y, and Z coordinates. This is the angular momentum vector um, in classical mechanics. But in quantum, we want to have a picture where the vector has a well-defined length, the vector has a well-defined z projection, and let z be vertical in the room, but we don't want it to have a well-defined x or y coordinate. So what we do is we consider this vector to, to process, right? Um, and this is this vector model of angular momentum. This vector, this stick, has a well-defined length, L. It's not changing. It has a well-defined Z projection, which is um, independent of time. But its X and Y components are undefined. Yep, its X and Y components are undefined, or more precisely, they're uncertain. But that's precisely what our mathematics was telling us. Moreover, this result, stated without proof, but I'll give you the promise that I will prove this uh, soon, using a method due to Dirac in a representation-free um, context, uh, the allowed projections of this vector uh, can change. They can have a number of different values, from uh, a negative value through to a positive value. So we can imagine um, this vector here uh, will have a negative projection. It's got a well-defined length, a well-defined L squared. It's got a well-defined Z projection, which is negative, negative L. Then we could consider the next, um, the, the next Z projection, which, um, you know what I mean, it'll be like this. Then the next one might be uh, this. And the next one would be, I'm regretting doing this, the next one will be this. Uh, and then the very highest um, uh, magnetic contour number, the very highest Z projection of this thing will be the following. Now, better than that um, stick-waving diagram is the diagram in your notes, uh, figure 19. 
uh, and this is the essence of the vector model for angular momentum. Here, the example of L equals 2 is chosen. Uh, this is a, um, and this object here is essentially the length squared of the vector. But you need to be a bit careful. In fact, the length of the vector is the length um, squared of the vector is L, L plus 1, H cross squared. So its length is really the square root of L into L plus 1, all multiplied by H cross. But the length increases with increasing L. You have five allowed projections, five allowed magnetic contour numbers of negative 2, 1, 0, 1, 2. And again, uh, this is illustrated with this heuristic vector model in figure 19. It's heuristic and not to be taken particularly seriously, again, because it's trying to picture in classical terms. You know, when we wave the stick around, that's the picture you can look at, and it's classical, in a sense. Um, it's uh, trying to picture something that's intrinsic and quantum mechanical in classical terms. And so it's ultimately uh, unsatisfactory. You could take a purist perspective and say, uh, trust the maths. Uh, your intuition is broken down. This is quantum mechanics. We know about um, lemon trees. So, so uh, intuition is broken down. Get over it. Uh, trust the mathematics. But this uh, vector model for angular momentum is a useful uh, heuristic device. And I close by stressing, close this section by stressing that this, that this model cannot be taken too seriously. This is now the first of two sections on the general theory of angular momentum. We've been considering a particular form of angular momentum so far, namely orbital angular momentum. But I gave an example of a second form of angular momentum, which is spin. Again, just to repeat, um, if you bring a particle to rest, such as an electron or a quark or a proton, uh, and you ask the question, or in the rest frame of this particle, it may still have angular momentum, and that so-called intrinsic angular momentum, we give the name of spin. It's a little bit of a misnomer because you can think of, of, of the particle, which is stationary, is in some sense spinning around its own axis, thereby having um, uh, angular momentum. But uh, since we're talking about structuralist point particles here, um, uh, such as quarks and such as electrons, such as um, uh, uh, anti-quarks and so on, since we're talking about um, objects that are, to our knowledge, structuralists, uh, they're fundamental particles, then you can't think of it as, some, as this intrinsic angular momentum as in some sense swirling through space. I actually want to discuss that question um, and the possible counter-arguments in the tutorial um, later today. But for now, I'll make the point that there's more than one type of angular momentum, one of which is orbital angular momentum which we've studied, but another type of angular momentum is spin. And spin is, can't be associated with swelling through space. It's something more general than this. Yep, so, so, so that's the key point. Uh, and this serves to motivate the idea that we want to study uh, angular momentum from a more general perspective. Going back to my favorite exercise, exercise 46b, uh, we showed that commutation relations are unchanged under a change of representation. Remember, you have the state vector of quantum mechanics, which is implying a representation-free um, object. This is just the electron doing whatever it does in a quantum system without anyone writing down equations to describe it. Uh, this is one th uh, formalism for quantum mechanics that has wave function psi obeying some, diff some, some equation, for example, a differential equation, the Schrodinger equation, and a set of linear operators. Then you have a different formulation of quantum mechanics that has some different representation of the wave function, uh, psi hat, some different representation of the operators, a hat, b hat, etc., and some other equation which, which governs uh, psi. It could be a differential equation if this is, um, uh, uh, it could be a differential equation, it could be an integral equation, it could be an integral differential equation, it could be a matrix equation, whatever um, representation you're using, you'll have an implied equation. And we know how to transform using unitary operators u and u dagger to transform from one allowed representation to another. But if, and there's infinite multiplicity of possible representations, but if you work in terms of commutation relations alone, we know from exercise 46b that those things unchanged under, under, under a change of representation, then you're doing representation-free quantum mechanics. So let's take this, the fact that we have this Lie algebra Let's take the fact that these operators are Hermitian and use nothing else. That's all you've got. 
use nothing else to do some calculations. That's going to set up the general theory of angular momentum. This, by the way, everything in this section and the next is due to Dirac. And we're going to learn some remarkable things. So for example, using this Lie algebra for, for home mission operators, that's all you've got, nothing else. You can learn, for example, the following fact. Every single particle in physics has a spin that's either a half integer or an integer, multiple of h cross. That's a very, very profound result, right? Every single particle of physics, the squark, the neutrino, um, the, the Higgs boson, um, every single fundamental particle of physics has a spin that's either an integer or a half integer. That result lies embedded in this Lie algebra. And we're going, to use, we're going to derive that result and many more in the general theory of angular momentum in this section and the next. So very profound. It's also very Dirac-like um, because you're working in a world where you have nothing but algebra. You know, this is physics, right? You're used to differential equations and crazy d by d thetas and d by d phi's and, and um, all sorts of orthogonal function expansions and so on. Here you have nothing but algebra. It's a very rarefied atmosphere in which to calculate. Very, very characteristic of Dirac, both in terms of its austerity and in terms of its genius. So working with commutation relations alone uh, imp implies an associated very high degree of generality. We're studying the general theory of angular momentum. So to begin with, uh, we're going to learn from these expressions. And we're just going to say that in the context of the general theory of angular momentum, you give me three operators. Now, x, y, and z is suggestive of Cartesian coordinates, um, but uh, these are just three operators that I happen to label j, x, j, y, and j, z. j is for general angular momentum. L is for orbital angular momentum. So just to give you the symbols, spin angular momentum will use an S. Orbital angular momentum will use an L. And general angular momentum will use a J. So let's have these three operators and suppose that they obey this Lie algebra. So Jx, Jy equals IH cross Jz. And then the cyclic permutations, X becomes Y, Y becomes Z, Z becomes X. Another cyclic permutation. Uh, Z, Y becomes Z, Z becomes X, X becomes Y. So I'm going to tell you that these things are Hermitian. And these things are by this Lie algebra, and that's it, nothing more. If that set of op linear operators um, obeys these axioms, then we will speak of it as a general angular momentum. It's a straight generalization of, of, of this, these formulas here. Any set of um, emission operators that obeys this Lie algebra is spoken of as um, a, a general angular momentum. Now we're going to be f um, repeating some of what we've, what we've done before, except there's going to be no thetas, no phi's, no spherical polar coordinates, no calculus, no differentiation. Um, we just have the algebra in this general setting. So you can have the analog of L squared, Pythagoras again. So you define this. So these things are, you define this, it's a definition, so I'll put a triple equal sign. That's a definition. You can show as a consequence, again, you have nothing but this Lie algebra of these permission operators using nothing else. You can show that J squared commutes with any one of the Js. It commutes with Jz. It commutes with um, Jx. And it commutes with Jy. So we just pick on one of them. And we say, hence, you can have simultaneous eigenfunctions of both um, J squared and JZ. These are going to be generalized spherical harmonics. So we're going to denote our generalized spherical harmonics as follows. And since we're doing representation-free quantum mechanics, we're going to have a ket to uh, suggest this. If you're in a, a, an XYZ or an R theta phi representation, then you would have uh, these generalized spherical harmonics given by the particular functional form in equations 211 and 212. But here, uh, we have just a, a generalized spherical harmonics, the generalized version of this equation here. So these simultaneous eigenfunctions exist because of this vanishing commutator. When j squared acts on this generalized spherical harmonic, you'll get the generalized version of this. <laughs> 
instead of little l, we'll have little j. Uh, these generalized spherical harmonics are also eigenfunctions of jz. Our generalized magnetic quantum number we're going to call m. Uh, j will be our generalized l. It'll be our um, general uh, orbital angular momentum uh, quantum number. So let me now state two things without proof, because I'm going to prove them in the next section. The allowed values of the um, general angular momentum quantum number j are as follows. And so, so since this is, in essence, um, the magnitude of the angular momentum, strictly speaking, the square root of j into j plus 1 h bar uh, is the, the magnitude of angular momentum with that caveat. Since this is, in essence, the angular momentum, the magnitude of it, then, and since spin is a special case of angular momentum, we've just learned, if this is indeed true, that the spins of all intrinsic particles, of all fundamental particles, in fact, of all particles, full stop, uh, is either 0, half, 1, 3 halves, 2, etc. And these are in units of H cross, because we siphoned off a H cross um, uh, here. So that result alone contains the idea that all fundamental particles, in fact, all fundamental or composite particles, um, a proton is a composite particle made up of three quarks, uh, that alone contains the idea, the profound idea, the profound f physical result that all spins are either integral or half integral. We also have our generalised magnetic quantum number and think of the, 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 the spinning stick with its different projections, minus j, minus j plus 1, all the way up to j in steps of 1. So these are two key results, equations 217 and 18, which we'll prove. So if, as a special case of this theory of uh, general angular momentum, we chose spin as a special case, just to reiterate what I, what I was saying before, the spin might be zero, which will be true, for example, for pions. The spin could be a half, which will be true for objects such as uh, quarks, protons, neutrons, uh, and electrons. The spin could be one, uh, as it is for a photon, uh, and so on. There are more exotic particles that have higher spins than this. Protons and neutrons, by the way, are, are um, uh, composite particles, but this result applies generally. Again, very, very profound uh, physical result. Just to emphasize that in the standard model of particle physics, strongly interacting particles, particles that feel the strong force, are considered to be made of quarks. Um, there are so-called mesons, where you have a quark and an antiquark. Each individual quark uh, um, has a spin of a half. Uh, the mesons are a quark-antiquark -quark pair. You also have the baryons, uh, such as the protons, which have uh, three quarks. You have the antibaryons, which have three antiquarks. You also have very exotic particles called pentaquarks, which have uh, three quarks and two antiquarks. But they're very, very exotic, short-lived particles. Again, I'm just making the idea, making up the idea that protons, uh, neutrons, um, or more generally, um, all forms of baryons, mesons, and so on, are considered to be composite particles. But the composite particle and the constituents are all bound by this uh, result of um, Sophus Lee's algebra. So we've got these two uh, big claims, and the time now comes to prove those big claims, which is what we do in section 33. So this is our general angular momentum continued. Again, there'll probably be not a clean end to today's class because we won't get, we certainly won't get through this. But this is an example. We've finally reached the, the promised land where we're going to do uh, representation-free quantum mechanics, meaningful calculations using nothing but uh, Lie algebra of Hermitian operators. And again, I emphasise this is due to Dirac. Due to Dirac. So let me begin with section 33.1. This is called raising and lowering operators. Uh, those are given the names J plus and J minus. I was waving my stick around, right? And I, I said, for example, you have this, where you have the particular magnetic quantum number M. Then I kicked it up one, 
to um, a bigger M. Question, how do you take a quantum system which, for example, has uh, a, um, a particular value of M and it's processing like this, and then you kick it up one to a higher value of M. Uh, this would be called a raising operator. Similarly, you could have a lowering operator. So we need operators that raise or lower the allowed values of M, which take you uh, up and down. Uh, which take you up and down uh, this allowed chain of possible M's. Yep. But again, we have nothing but um, a, a Lie algebra emission operators. So let's introduce a definition, J plus is going to be a certain linear combination, a certain complex linear combination of the JX's and JY's. Uh, J minus will be the following. One, by the way, is a Hermitian conjugate of the other. N remember also that since JX and JY are Hermitian, they equal their own uh, daggers, similarly for Y and Z. So these are the definitions of J plus and J minus. Again, this is a world where you have nothing but algebra in essence. So there's a toolkit that you need to derive, and this is exercise 58, which we'll go through in the tube. There's a toolkit of three results, equations 220 in the notes, uh, which are, are the basic algebraic tools, consequences of, of um, this, which will help us do our calculations. The first is that if you take j squared, and calculate its commutator with j plus, you'll get naught. If you do the same thing with j squared and j minus, you'll also get naught. That's just written compactly in one equation here. Second of three results, if you take j plus and multiply by j minus, that's the same thing as j squared minus jz squared plus h bar jz. There's a second result which I'm going to pack together. If you take so you either read the upper sign or the lower sign when you have two signs on top of each other. J minus times J plus equals J squared minus JZ squared minus H bar JZ. This is the second of three algebraic results in our Dirac toolkit. And the last one is that if you calculate the commutator of J plus, of JZ, sorry, and J plus or minus, you'll get plus or minus H bar JZ. So these are uh, algebraic tricks in our toolkit that you, you'll derive in exercise 58 and that we'll derive in the next tu tutorial. I've yet to justify the statement or the claim that these G J pluses and J minuses are raising and lowering operators respectively, and I've yet to render precise uh, what I mean by a raising and lowering operator, apart from just my, me waving the stick. Um, that precision will come within the next few minutes. So let's consider the following object. And I'm just pulling this out of the air. This is um, Dirac in his study at home uh, with, his, with his library full of 60% um, full of gardening books, I'm serious, and 40% full of, of, of physics books, uh, working out this algebra. And then he works out the right answer and that's what he publishes. So let's just pull this out of the air to begin with and we'll understand where it's coming from soon. I want to calculate this object. Our generalised spherical harmonic we act on it with either j plus or j minus, and then we act on it with j squared. These braces are implicit, but let me put them in explicitly. All right. I have my toolkit. I have my Hermitian operators, um, Lie algebra. I have these consequences of this Lie algebra, and that's all. So if I ask what to do next, the answer is this or this or this or this or this or this, right? Um, the j squared, j plus minus. I look at this object here. So this one here. If I expand this, I get j squared, j plus minus, minus this times this equals naught. In other words, these things commute. Order doesn't matter. j squared, j plus minus is the same thing as the same objects in the opposite order. So I can flick these things around. So I, can, I do so. It's good for me to flick these things around because I know what happens when J squared acts on JM. This is a, this is a generalized spherical harmonic. Let me just rewrite the left-hand side. The J plus minus is just hanging around for the ride. 
when j squared acts on j plus m, on jm, we get j to j plus 1 h cross squared. Now this is just a number. It can certainly come out the front. So let's do that. I know order matters in quantum mechanics, but when it's just a number, it can go anywhere. Again, you expect to be doing differential equations, but you have nothing but algebra here. And I can put braces around this. Why am I doing this? Because I want to um, interpret um, something about the j squared, about the j plus minuses. The object that I've underlined in re red is the same. So this equation uh, has the form of an eigenvalue equation. We take our generalized spherical harmonic, we act on it with either j plus or minus, and then we ask the question, what is the squared length of the result? Squared length acts on this object to give this eigenvalue times this object. So what, what this is telling us is um, since this eigenvalue uh, is exactly the same as if this j plus or minus wasn't there, this is telling us that this operator, j plus and j minus, does not change little j. It does not change little j. That's consistent with me waving my stick uh, and going from um, one projection to another. The key point there is that I've, I haven't changed the length of the stick. Yep. So this says we don't change the length of the stick um, when you act with j plus or j minus on this jm. That's half the story. We need the second half of the story. I'm going to see if I can use one of these bits, little bits of chalk without breaking it. We'll see how it goes. The second uh, thing that we want to do is to... No. <laughs> All right. um, um, the second thing we want to do is to consider this object once again, which was underlined in red, but now I want to pull out a JZ and ask what happens. So let's do this. Um, these brackets might as well not be there. Now I stare at this, and Dirac stares at this, and Dirac knows that uh, he wants the JZ to be in front of this thing, because we know what happens when JZ acts on the generalized spherical harmonic. So you want to switch these things around. If we want to switch these things around, this thing tells us how to do so. This times this minus this times this equals that. So write that out explicitly, and you'll have a formula to turn jz, j plus minus into its opposite, but you pick up an extra term when you do so. So from, this, um, uh, from that particular member of the toolkit, when you uh, interchange these, that's what we want. We want to interchange them. When you interchange them, you pick up an extra term, uh, which is as follows. And the spherical harmonic, the generalized spherical harmonic back again. Now, when Jz acts on this, we know what happens. You pick up mh cross. So I'm going to rub this out and replace it with mh cross. So let's factor out uh, this m uh, plus or minus 1. And what we're left with will be, um, so m plus or minus 1 h cross is factored out, and you're left with j plus or minus uh, jm, which I can put in braces. And now we're going to underline with our chalk again. Again, ha has the structure of an eigenvalue equation. When you ask the question, what is the z projection of, 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 uh, of um, this object, this object's general angular momentum, if this j plus wasn't there, you get an m h cross. But acting with j plus has increased the value of m by 1. Acting with j minus has decreased the value of m uh, by 1. Yep. So those are the two statements that j plus or minus does not change the little j associated with this object. And secondly, uh, j plus or minus raises or lowers the value of the magnetic quantum number uh, little m. And so this allows us to call j plus and j minus um, uh, a raising 
and lowering operator, respectively. Uh, I'll stop there and I'll see you next time. Thank you.